G'day everyone, and thank you for joining us as we continue to work our way through the book of James. And I don't know about you, but I've been really struck and amazed by how relevant the book of James has been, even though it was written so many centuries earlier. We've, we've looked at issues such as temptation, as being patient through trials, being friends, being friends with the world, uh, issues of div- division and disunity, controlling our tongue, seeking to be patient and prayerful. So many things that are so relevant to us in the here and now. And today is no less the case as we consider the future and our plans for the future. I'm sure just like myself and my family, you've had many plans have, it, have to be cancelled and changed in the last two years. I think there's five or six holidays that we, we've planned that we've had to cancel over the last couple of years. And, and while we might wish to return to those times of certainty, this passage, I think, has something to teach us about this moment that we're in and what we can learn from it. But first, before we look at that passage, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. So please pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you, we love you, you are our Lord and our strength, you are our rock and our fortress and our deliverer in whom we take refuge. Father, you are our shield, the horn of our salvation, our stronghold. And Father, we call upon you, you who are worthy of all praise. Father, we thank you for this new day and this opportunity to hear from you, to listen to your word. Father, please give us ears to hear what you have to say to us. May there not be words that go in one ear and out the other. Father, may your word change us. May that transform us, Father. May we live differently because of who you are and who you have made us to be. Father, we fall short and need to come to you again, confessing our sin. And Father, we are so thankful that you are a merciful, forgiving God, and we can only come to you through the purifying work of Jesus' blood, and we thank you for that. Father, we pray for us as a church, that we would be united as we navigate the difficult months ahead, Help us to keep our eyes upon you, Father, that you would be big and that we would be small, that we would grow in humility and dependence upon you. Bind us to each other. Bind us to yourself, Father. Father, we pray too for the ministry of AFES at Monash and the work of Stu and Dan there. We pray that you would continue to equip them to lead that ministry. Enable them to love and care, to speak the glorious truth of the gospel. Father, we pray for inquirers to be captivated by you, Father. Draw them to yourself. And Father, may those who are inquiring, considering Christianity, take that step of trust, trusting in you and depending upon you. Father, we pray for the young believers that they would be built up, that they would be equipped and trained to be mature, to persevere following you for the long haul. Father, we pray for that community to be united, to be enthused and selfless and sacrificial. Father, we pray that you would bless the work there for your glory and the building up of your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our reading today comes from James chapter 4, so please open up your Bibles to James chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. We're going to read to the end of the chapter. James 4, verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, Spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? 
You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. If there has ever been a year where the the very idea of planning for the future has been stumped, it's 2021. I mean, it was difficult enough last year in 2020. You know, last year was like, I don't know, walking around with a sprained right ankle, hobbling around. It was hard to to, to make progress. And, And this year, it's like, well, the right ankle's still sprained, and now the left ankle is also sprained. We've been stopped in our tracks. I mean, and surely one of the lessons from this pandemic is how uncertain are our plans? How insecure are many of our dreams and life expectations? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that these plans are wrong, but they are uncertain. And our plans reveal what our hearts are longing for. And when our plans are interrupted or, or, or pulled apart, it also reveals what our hearts are like. I wonder, what are you planning once we finally leave lockdown and return to some sense of normalcy? Again, it's difficult to be making plans at the moment and many people are just trying to survive. Uh, Many others, though, I am sure, are already thinking about the future. Many of us have hopes and plans for what we want to do and what we want to achieve. Well, James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, give us wisdom from God as we look to the future. It begins by saying, listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there or carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. At the first glance, we might be reading James as saying, don't make plans at all. You might read these verses and think, oh, so it's wrong to make plans for the future. Just live in the moment. Carpe diem, seize the day. But of course, there are other parts of the Bible that encourage planning and that talk about Christians making plans. You know, one example is that of the Apostle Paul. At the start of his letter to the Romans, he says this, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now. And at the end of the same letter, he says this, Since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. So it's not inherently wrong to make plans. Think of the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. Proverbs gives us wisdom about planning for the future, and it also talks about the limitations of our planning. Here are three examples. Proverbs 15 verse 22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel. But with many advisors, they succeed. Or Proverbs 16, 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans of a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So how do we make sense of what James is teaching us about the future? Well, the issue in this passage seems to be one of presumptuousness. That's the word that the Bible commentator Alec Mattia uses to describe what James is getting at. Every time I try to say the word presumptuousness, it doesn't really roll off the tongue, does it? Um, But I think it is a word that, that accurately describes what's going on. There is the sin of presumptuousness. Although better still, let's use the word that James uses back in verse 6. Pride. As James talks about the future, what he is saying here is avoid pride when you are planning the future. So let's take a look at this scripture. Verse 13, now listen, you who say. So he's calling out those who are speaking in a certain way about the future. He says, you know, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. 
This verse is describing a self-confident person. There is an air of presumption. I know what I want, and I know what I'm going to achieve, and I will get there. And see, this presumption is not only the belief that we can know the future, but that we can control the future, that we can make the future happen in accord with our plans. You know, when we're talking about desires and plans, you know, it's amazing how quickly, even when we're just talking about it in everyday uh, conversation, it's amazing how quickly we default to that language of rights and what someone deserves, as though if I have a dream, I can demand it to become a reality. But James asks, why? Why do you think that way? In verses 14 and 15, he gives us three reasons why we need to get rid of pride or the sin of presumptuousness when we are making plans. He mentions three things, our ignorance, our frailty, and our dependence. Firstly, we are ignorant of tomorrow. Look at verse 14. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. We're not... Uh, Doctor Strange, you know, from the Marvel comics, uh, who can travel through time. Uh, In the movie Infinity War, Doctor Strange says this. He says, I went forward in time to view alternate futures to see all the possible outcomes of the coming conflict. Well, what James does, he brings us back to earth. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. I mean, who of us knew that at the start of 2020, a global pandemic was about to strike? Who of us could predict that over the last 18 months, we have missed 50 weeks of in-person church together? Who of us could have known that our children would miss months of school? And that shops and offices would shut down and many people would lose their jobs and most of us would have to work from home on our kitchen bench? I mean, what did any of us have in our yearly plan at the beginning of 2021? And can we even say with certainty what December this year will look like? Often we attach to our our planning and our calendar a a sense of hubris or false confidence. And and I suspect this is one of the the big uh, big, uh, lessons we are going to learn over these past two years. We do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Not only is our knowledge of the future limited, 2 James says we are frail human beings. He compares our life to mist. He says, what is your life? You are a mist that appears a little while and then vanishes. His point is life is transitory. We are here for a few short years and then gone. And thirdly, We are dependent on God. Look at verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Perhaps you've heard people say, and Christians suggest, that it's wrong for us to, if we're praying, to say, if the Lord's will. Or if we're talking about what we want to see happen, it's wrong, if not sinful, to say, if it is the Lord's will. Because if you truly believe and trust God, the logic goes, when you just ask with confidence, you don't need to qualify it with anything else. To say, if it's the Lord's will, that implies doubt or a lack of belief. But friends, that is not true at all. Scripture teaches us we ought to say, if it is the Lord's will. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus was praying and he prayed to his Father in heaven saying, your will be done. I mean, the Lord's Prayer. Jesus is teaching uh, us to, to pray, how to pray, and he says, your will be done. It is not a lack of faith in God when we say, if it is the Lord's will. What we are communicating is that we are committing ourselves to God's sovereign care and purposes. You know, when I'm feeling confident about my plans or when I'm, I'm looking ahead and I just don't know what to do. And, I, and both times I say, Lord, if you will, that is the right disposition. And this humble position, it doesn't mean when we're nothing more than passengers in the car and God's doing all the driving and, and he's going to direct us whether we like it or not. That's not the case. That's not what James is saying. Maybe you have a, a view of God 
and, and of ourselves that maybe we're like characters in the Truman Show. Remember that that uh, that movie, The Truman Show, and and and, and it's like God's uh, is pulling all of the strings behind the scenes, like a director who is directing a reality TV series, and maybe that's your view of God, but that is not God. That's not the God of the Bible. I was watching an episode uh, a couple of nights ago of the the great Anthony Bourdain, uh, the, the you know the chef and the the, the, the cooking writer and uh, TV host. Anyway, he in this episode is visiting the island of Sicily, down in the, the south of Italy, and he's trying going around tasting the, the best of Sicilian food, and uh, he's hired a boat uh, with a local dro- uh, diver, and they're going to go out and do some fishing. And so they've got their wetsuits on and their snorkels and they're out there to catch apparently octopus and clams and cuttlefish. But Anthony begins to be a little suspicious because the waters are, are where the boat is, is, is it's, it's covered with, with tourists. There are people swimming everywhere and there are boats is whizzing around. Uh, but the diver assures him, no, 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 there, there is seafood down there. You, you can catch fish down here. Anyway, so the camera shows uh, Anthony Bourdain jumping off the boat and into the water, and he's swimming just beneath the surface when all of a sudden he sees an octopus right in front of him. But it's a dead octopus, and it just slowly, gently to the bottom of the water. And he comments, that's kind of weird, strange. And then he sees... Just a few moments later, another octopus, another dead octopus, this lifeless uh, sea creature uh, just being uh, pushed around by the current and slowly descending to the sand. And then the the cameraman takes uh, more footage of other sea uh, creatures that are seemingly falling out of the sky and into the water. Clams and and octopus and, and cuttlefish. You see, Anthony, who's gone uh, diving to catch some fresh seafood to taste the best of Sicily, he then realizes what's going on. The fishermen above him in the boat are throwing in frozen seafood into the water for him to catch, as though it's the real thing. As though he can't tell the difference between you know, living and dead sea animals. And, and again, sometimes I think we have this view of God in our lives, that that's what he's doing. He's trying to, to trick us, or he's trying to manipulate us. He's trying to pull the strings. And Friends, that's not God. That's not God. To say if it is the Lord's will, that is an act of trust. It is to say, I am trusting God. And it is saying, I am trusting the God of the Bible. Whom I know and love, whom I know, who, he loves me. It's trusting in the God who made the universe, who has mapped out the beginning and the end. It is trusting the God who is good. You know, we read in, in the scriptures how Jesus knew what lay ahead of him. When he came in, into the world, he knew the course that was set for him. That course that was leading to the cross and to death. Hebrews 12 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. If the Lord's will, you know, saying, that it's saying firstly that I can trust this God, but it's also saying, let my tomorrow conform to God's purposes. Again, it's not um, this manipulative God behind the scenes or just throwing stuff at us. It is trusting the good God and asking him that my plans will conform to his good purposes. You know, an individual person may find their, their plans interrupted and, and sometimes just torn up. Maybe they're hit with sickness or suddenly they, they lose their job. But what we've been experiencing over the last 18 months is is kind of unusual. It's certainly unusual in in Australia. That is because we have an entire nation who's found its plans abruptly stopped. And I wonder, surely, perhaps, this is time, a God-given opportunity for us to reconsider the future, to ask some, some questions. What is it we're living for? What are our goals? What are our hopes? 
Now, what, what is the Lord's revealed will? Because surely as Christians, we want our plans to align with God's plans. And God's big plan isn't a secret because the Bible tells us that the word of God informs us, doesn't it? What God's plan is. It's about Jesus. It's about the kingdom of God. And so when we say, if it is the Lord's will, we are asking and praying that our plans will conform to God's will. That is, let the reality of Christ and the kingdom of God shape how we are looking to the future. You know, in that beautiful passage in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about the sparrows and the, and the lilies and, and, and he describes wonderfully how God provides for them and God, how God cares for them. They're just wonderful images, aren't they? How God made the flowers and how he provides. And, and even the little birds, he cares for them. And then Jesus notes also that God you know, can count the number of hairs on our head. And then he says, if God cares for and feeds animals and plants, how much more does he love you? And he knows what we need, the food to eat, the clothes to wear. But he, then Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So what does that look like? Here's a, a few examples. Don't be a part-time church member. Don't be casual about God's people, but be intentional. Be present and serving and loving and building up. It means that we don't use money as unbelievers do. And yes, we can enjoy good things in the world around us, but let God's kingdom inform and direct our use of finance. It means don't sacrifice your family for the sake of worldly success. It means don't turn your back on Jesus in order to win some sort of short-term gain or acceptance by some social group or by your peers. As we finally begin to, to think of, of you know, beyond the pandemic and moving out of lockdown and, and we're, we're finishing up 2021 and uh, moving into 2022, where in all of that, where does Jesus feature? How is the gospel defining the plans you want to make? And then in verses 16 and 17, James says this, do the good we ought to do today. Not just about making plans for tomorrow, but what about today? <laughs> what are we meant to be doing now in the moment? Look at verses 16 and 17. As it is you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So some plans are not just mistakes, but they are arrogant, James says. They are even evil and sinful. And the evil amounts, it seems, to a person being so driven by their own plans that they are ignoring the good that we should be doing today. You know, so you know, I'm choosing against helping someone in need today because tomorrow I've planned something for myself. Well, I'm going to avoid generosity today because I'm aiming to save more money for the future. Or will I sacrifice doing good for the sake of fulfilling all the different life experiences that are on my to-do list? Or does success mean more to me than doing good? James isn't putting a ban on planning and keeping a diary or calendar and having visions. and He is speaking, though, against self-sufficiency and self-importance. That is both removing God from the center of our hearts and hopes for tomorrow and removing doing good to others. You know, where this scripture is describing you, I encourage you to repent and, and ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you and to change you. I've started listening to a podcast that's uh, about the TV miniseries Band of Brothers, which I'm sure some of you have uh, watched. It's a wonderful uh, television series. 
It's 20 years since Band of Brothers first aired on television. 20 years. And this $120 million production has over time become renowned as one of the greatest television series ever produced. It is gripping and dramatic and a wonderful retelling of history. You know, on the podcast, Tom uh, Hanks is interviewed and he's talking about the, the, the premiere of the show on the 9th of September, 2001. So after a, an entire year of filming and years in, in, of making, the first episode aired. And there was so much expectation around uh, this, this show. The 9th of September, 2001. Two days later was 9-11. No one saw it coming. No one was prepared. And on this podcast, Hanks is talking about how they didn't know what to do with this show. Would it ever be aired again? They did not know what the future was looking like. And he wasn't complaining, but they were trying to process, how can they televise a show about the Second World War when in real life there are thousands of Americans who had just been killed and it seemed like America would be entering a new war? All that planning and money and preparing, it was just all went up in the air. It was so uncertain. Now, I realize some of us are too young to remember 9-11, but I understand, before that event, that, that day, in those first months of the 21st century, people's lives were just filled with, with a sense of optimism. There was a sense that the 20th century was being left behind with all of its horrors. It was finally being put to rest, and a new start was being given to the world. And a new century, a new millennium. But then 9-11 just shredded that optimism. But as the producers of Band of Brothers were wondering, what are we going to do with this TV show? Will it ever be appropriate to, 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 uh, to air the final nine episodes or not? As they were pondering all this, there was another American who was making decisions. His name is Max Stiles. And on September 13, so two days after 9-11, on September 13, he and his wife made a decision. They sold their home that day and then prepared to move to the Middle East because they wanted to show that the church's response wasn't going to be military, but it was missionary. He went and shared the gospel with people in the Middle East, and he started a church. And on the first Sunday following 9-11, another Christian was addressing his church, uh, this church is located in Midtown, New York City, just a few miles north of where the Twin Towers once stood. And, and in this sermon, just a few days after 9-11, this is what Tim Keller had to say. So he's addressing his church. He said, Do we do volunteer work? Yes. Do we help the people who've been displaced? Yes. Do we help the people who were bereaved? Yes. But consider this. Over the next months and years, New York may become a more difficult, dangerous place to live economically, politically, vocationally, or emotionally. It feels like a today, does it not? But if that happens, let's stay. Let us enter into the problems. The city is going to need neighbors and friends and people who are willing to live here and be part of a great city. It may be more difficult and expensive just to be this church for the next few months and years. I don't know. But if that is the case, the best thing we can do for the city is to stay here and be ourselves, even though it may cost more money or take more time. Maybe we are going to have to be a little less concerned about our own careers and more concerned about the community. So let's enter in. Let's not just fix it. Let's weep with those who weep. Friends, as we look ahead in, in the next few months, weeks, as God willing, we will um, enter out of lockdown. Mentone Baptist Church, let us commit to doing good. Now, I can't see what the coming months are going to be like. 
the plan is that in a few weeks' time, Melbourne is going to crawl out of what has been the longest lockdown in the world. And we still don't know yet all of the difficulties that lay ahead and the, and the tensions that are going to be experienced. But there are two things that I know. Number one, God says to us in his word today, let us not neglect doing good today. And number two, God has shown us in his word what his big picture plan is for the world, including Melbourne. And he is committed to his plan. And his plan is to glorify his son, Jesus Christ. His plan is to grow his church. His plan is to build his kingdom. And in his grace and love, he has included us into this plan. So let us seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And Jesus assures us and all these other things will be given to you as well. And how short life is. How brief it is. We can trust God with our years. If we can trust God with the the biggest things, that is eternal life and the kingdom of God, we can also trust God with the smaller things, what we are eating, where we work, where we live. Again, it is not wrong to have plans. It is not unwise to have plans. But be humble and let God's plan in the gospel keep filtering and revising our hopes and our plans. My encouragement to you is this. Over the next couple of weeks, take some time just to quietly evaluate that the hopes that you have, the hopes that you have for the future, share them with, with someone. If you're married, you know, talk, as, a, as together, as, as a couple, talk about it. If you have children, talk with them about these plans. Share them with friends. Maybe even write them down. Use a pencil, though. What are your plans for the next three months, six months, 12 months? Plans for for work. Plans for rest. Plans for serving. Plans for giving. Plans for study. Plans for your family. And, and, And then write them down. And then evaluate them in light of God's sovereignty and God's gospel purposes. And where needed, let God change those plans. And as you commit to them and pray through them, say to God, if it is your will, knowing that God's will for us is good and we can trust him. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this word from you today in James chapter 4. Father, we thank you that we can trust you with the future because you are God. You are sovereign and you are a good God. Father, where there there is pride in in the, the plans that we are making or in the dreams that we are setting, please forgive us. Help us to repent and to turn away from those, uh, that, that selfishness or that, that sense of uh, selfish ambition. Father, we ask that we will be uh, humble and that as we look to the future, we pray that your plans and purposes might inform and shape ours. But Father, we thank you that we can trust you with the future. And as we trust you with tomorrow, help us today to do the good that we ought to do. And Father, we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.